Welcome to the Friday edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 595, the Leaf Blower Free Edition. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is May 8th, VE Day. I'm sorry you guys missed out on all the wonderful leaf blowers and lawnmowers and spring activities going on outside. I think they're rushing because we're in store for a snowstorm tomorrow uh, here on the East Coast. Uh, Maine on South, they're gonna offer a nice foot of snow. You know, George, clearly COVID-19 is not enough. The murder flies are not enough. The crashing economy, the unemployment rate, the world on fire. Uh, it just wasn't enough. Now we have to have a snowstorm here in the Northeast just to to, to, to finish things off. I don't know. That, that may did be you, the one thing that gets me. Did you keep your receipts by any chance? Can yeah, you take I, a- I want a refund on 2020. Absolutely. I certainly want to return my 2020 calendar and day planner because uh, uh, it, it's been something else around here, George. Uh, I know the whole world is suffering. This is a, a global crisis. It's hard to, to watch because you're not just watching. You're participating. Everybody is participating in this. This is not a news event you're watching on CNN or Fox News that's occurring just somewhere else. It's occurring right outside your door. It's occurring right outside your church doors. It's occurring uh, with your neighbors and your friends and your family all around the world. And that's what's different about uh, this pandemic. It's not watching uh, planes hit a building in New York and you're watching it on TV. You are a full participant in the coronavirus pandemic. And uh, Jill, George and I pray for you. We uh, like your comments. We read your emails that you send us. And uh, we are with you in this. We, we are suffering as well uh, in just many different ways. George, eight weeks ago, never thought that his main job before the sermon would be trying to get the right focus, the right lighting the right internet connection all that set up i mean everything is topsy-turvy george and i never had the appreciation for all the grief heaven has gone through for 10 years to turn out (laughs) these shows because i've had to basically learn how to do his job which I don't do very well no, you do in the right. Russian environment. <laughs> it, it's oh. a high learning curve. And I, I want people, the priests have really adapted well, the clergy and all this. I, I get to watch on my feed uh, on Facebook, the, the Sunday services, the morning prayers, evening prayers, uh, compliance. You guys are doing great. Are you How all many per- people did you actually wind up talking on the phone with uh, in, after, the, your video, after your I, videos were released? Not just priests, but IT people, the whole works, probably 120, 125. We had thousands of people watch the live stream. Lots of people responded by email. I probably answered 300 email. That was wonderful. And about 125 people contacted through text or phone one way or the other. You can't do that now because I dropped my phone. It's cracked. It's on its way to Apple. So don't call this week, okay? Because I'm not going to answer. It's not that I'm tired of answering, but send me an email if you have any more questions. But everybody's up live streaming. It's wonderful as an IT person to see you guys take on the challenge that is uh, operating in a virtual online world. Welcome to something brand new uh, that's being offered. Let's get to some news uh, real quick. But uh, before we do, I need you to like share, comment, subscribe, and we have a podcast in the show notes. Um, VE Day, George. A lot so has, why I'm dressed this way? Yeah, you're dressed that way. I just remember years ago, uh, I grew up in the Midwest, and all my relatives had participated in one way or another in World War II, either volunteering, buying war bonds, some were uh, soldiers, and there was kind of that mentality you grew up with that you're participating and enjoying the wisdom of the greatest generation. That's slowly evaporating. I think we're down to, you know, a, a small percentage of the people alive today were alive in World War II. When I started off as a priest, I think every man over 65 
and many women had some connection to the war, either mm -hmm. serving uh, in the military or in industry, in defense industries. It was a universal experience. And today uh, I celebrated at nine o'clock a, a VE Day Thanksgiving and prayer service. I live streamed it and I came home and I still have my costumes on. Uh, well, the whole thing we, that reminds me of something. We have a younger audience who may not even know what VE Day is. It's the celebration of victory in Europe over uh, the, or the surrender of Nazi Germany, is basically what it was. Well, yeah. I've read somewhere that the Second World War is for for the uh, for the younger generation. They're Star Wars. I mean, it's a that's what was, yeah, <laughs> and a land you know far far off, far far, far away, far away, a long yeah. time ago. Sure, uh, but I still have in my congregation two men in their mid nineties who were young soldiers. Uh, one fought in the Pacific, one in uh, Europe. 1819 and 44, 45, yeah. who's still with us. And when I started, every man was, you know, every man of their generation was there. And they're all, the greatest generation is, is slowly going away. Mm. Um, now, I've done, done this before. When I was first starting out, the World War I generation were beginning to, were fading out fast, and the World War II generation. And so today we, we gave thanks for their service and uh, uh, just, uh, offered prayers and thanksgiving to God for the defeat of the evils of fascism in Europe. Yeah, incredible. And I don't think we'll, hopefully we have a time when we are called as individuals to live up to that uh, high bar they set. Uh, for us, it's it, our current war is COVID. COVID-19 is the pandemic war that's going on around the world and uh, it, it's strange to watch. Let's talk a little bit about the changing of the tides. When I first started Anglican TV, one of the first uh, VIPs, uh, high-level people I met was Bishop Manirnis, uh, who was the Bishop of Middle East in Jerusalem. And great guy, he was uh, always a straight shooter. He never ever hemmed and hawed over what he thought was right. He's now retiring, George. Yes, he turned 70, and the Diocese of Egypt had a, an online synod meeting in Cairo from, uh, I think, All Saints Cathedral there, mm -hmm. and they elected a coadjutor, and they've elected a great guy. Sami Shahada is the bishop for North Africa, uh, and he's the dean of their seminary in Alexandria. He's the dean of St. Mark's Pro Cathedral in Alexandria. And he has Episcopal oversight for Algeria, Libya, and Tunisia. He is going to be the new Bishop of Egypt. And this is somebody who, Foley Beach, was one of the consecrators in 2017. He's been very active in the Global South movement. And he's about 10, 12 years younger than Munir and Nice and so he comes into this without some of the uh, 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 Canterbury worship that we saw. <laughs> we want to say appreciation <laughs> at one time among leaders of the Anglican world, where there's all, all you know only good comes from Canterbury. Mm -hmm. So he's he's been through the wars and he's seen both sides, and so my hope and expectations are that this is going to we're going to see another rising star of the Anglican firmament. Yeah, and I, Sammy Shahada. I, I think Sammy is going to be great. He'll be great for GAFCON. Um, and it's going to be fun to watch this new generation of uh, bishops and archbishops take hold. Now, they're doing a reformulation over there in the Middle East with the Horn and geographically. What's happening? Well, they're splitting up that province uh, into two right now, but eventually three. Mm -hmm. uh, Egypt is going to be its own province by the end of the year and it'll be called the province of alexandria okay and it will have four dioceses north africa the horn of africa gambella which is in the mountains of ethiopia and egypt and those four dioceses will constitute the newest province in the Anglican world and sammy being the bishop of the largest diocese and with this sort of a natural leader among the people in that diocese, I expect will be elected archbishop. Mm. And so we'll... It's always a dicey thing when a Gafcon archbishop retires. 
because oh. you've had things like in Tanzania and West Africa where the yeah. province flips from the Gafcon camp back into the Canterbury camp or into the TEC camp. Uh, and we're going to basically getting a new new player on this world scene. And I expect Sammy, uh, who has a bit of an... Is See, the, the, the thing about Munir and Nice, not only was a brain man, he was a medical doctor by training. Mm -hmm. He... He, he and before him, Drexel Gomez, were the institutional memories of the primates' meetings. They were there for 10 years, each or 15 years. And so sure. they remembered what happened at the previous meeting. So one of the things is when a third of the primates change at, between every meeting or whatnot, Justin Welby and the Anglican Consultative Council have a habit of basically pushing the reset button. Oh. Did we place the Episcopal Church on double secret probation? Oh. I'll have to ask Dean Warner yeah, yeah, well, whether, on? whether or not that still counts. <laughs> and so, in other words, we'd have a primates meeting where they're going to they're going to set up a committee which will report on the steps taken by the Episcopal Church to clean up its act. New primates meeting. I don't remember that. Does anybody uh, remember that? Uh, it didn't going, make the, you, not in the what, notes. What, did we what are do? you talking about? <laughs> yeah. So with Sammy, I think we have the potential. A number of primates come and go, and basically we never get a measure of them, and they're only there for four or five years, and they don't really have a sense of how the game is played. But here you've got the potential for a leader of sound, orthodox, theological underpinnings. Uh, he's got a PhD from a British university, so he's no dummy. And we'll just see how well he plays with others, okay. if this is going to be one of the new leaders in the Anglican world. Now, I'm going to transition to news here, and we're going to talk about what's going to happen in about eight months. In about eight months, the maternity wards around the world are going to be a little fuller. There's going to be lots of happen in there. And it's because of what I call COVID boredom. And COVID boredom uh, allows couples like Mr. and Mrs. Carlson, it's, I'm sure it's happened once or twice, to find each other attractive again because we're so bored. House is to say it, and so uh, in, in condos. Does your wife and watch this show, Kevin? She doesn't watch this show. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be getting fucked if she heard what I was talking about. And I'm sure it's happening in your house as well uh, for you couples. That uh, out of sheer boredom, this COVID thing has led you to some reattraction. And I was reading an article that we posted a response to a Guardian article where they kind of misrepresented what was happening in Uganda, where the archbishop was wisely saying, listen, this is boring times. Your husband's going to want to be on board. Please practice safe sexual practices and uh, think ahead before you do something. And the English church, I think they were thinking about the Roman Catholics or something, George. What, what, what happened with the story? Oh, this is a wonderful example of how crappy the press is. Yes. Uh, the God, on, a, on April 14th, the new Archbishop Samuel, uh, Stephen, Stephen Kazimba, Stephen. Uh, gave a sermon. He live streamed a sermon from uh, All Saints Cathedral, Mamarimbe, which is in, outside of Kampala. Just think of that, all live streaming services from Uganda. Amazing. Well, in the service, uh, he is a very down-to-earth, practical person, and he has uh, a concern for women, raising them up educationally, economically, opportunity, equal treatment of men and women in society and in the mm -hmm. marriage. Um, and one of the things he said in the sermon is that women, you need to be careful. There's some lazy men. Uh, there's some men who are going to take advantage of this time, and you need to practice family planning. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the theme was, you know, the old way had been have 10 children because three will survive to adulthood, and that's an economic uh, boon for you. Now, uh, and he's basically saying, have three children, educate them well, love them well, space them well, and they will be a credit to you in your old age. Don't just have children out of physical boredom. Use contraception. Well, The Guardian ran this article saying, 
Anglican Church in Africa changed his teaching on contraception. It had been a sin and wrong, and now they say it's okay, isn't this? And so then the Guardian introduced interviews a Catholic cleric who says, yes, Anglicans are sinners because they allow contraception. And then a family planning advocate saying, oh, isn't it wonderful that they finally wised up? Well, I'm scratching my head, and being a collector of Anglican minutiae, I sort of know these things, and I said, that's not right. So this I wrote the contact. About a Lamb it was, didn't a Lambeth conference address this? Yeah, 1930 and 1958. 1930, the Lambeth conference said contraception is moral and licit for Anglicans. And in 1958, they had a very a long doctrinal theological paper explaining why contraception is God's will and not necessarily a fig leaf for the sexual revolution. And if my memory serves, I thought the Roman Catholic Church almost went there as well, George. Yes, uh, Pope Paul VI uh, mm -hmm. uh, shocked his uh, theological advisors and is still giving a big pain in the ass to Cardinal Casper and the uh, and the liberal group. And the uh, the Catholic Church at Vatican II was on the road towards adopting the Anglican standard consciously adopting the Anglican yeah. standard, using the work that was done in the 50s, when Paul VI said no and came out with the encyclical Humanae Vitae, which okay. uh, said contraception is a no-no. Uh, but there are still a goodly number of liberal Catholic theologians and bishops and scholars who are pushing for the recognition of the licitness in, or the responsibility positively for contraception. Correct. Yeah. But so the Guardian is slamming the Anglicans up and down for changing their mind, uh, it basically because, oh, they're worried about a baby boom, uh, and therefore they're going to be so pragmatic, they're going to drop their theology. Well, I called you, I, I didn't telephone, I, I emailed Uganda, said, you know, what is this? Now, Uganda was on lockdown for six weeks, five weeks, meaning no public transit, the borders were closed, you couldn't move around the country, you had to stay at home. And actually it was easier for my contacts to get in touch with me Absolutely. than it was with other people <laughs> in Uganda. And finally I got the word back saying, no, 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 the Guardian doesn't know what they're talking about. First off, nobody contacted us. So the Guardian wrote a newspaper about a change in Anglican doctrine without actually talking to any Anglicans. I find that personally hard to believe, George, that a newspaper or CNN would make up news. Hey, you know, you know these things very rarely happen. Rarely. I, don't, I can't think of any other incident. No. But we're being sarcastic now. Yeah, friends. of course. Yeah, uh, just in case you didn't know, news, and I think journalism is the bi biggest suffrage of the last decade. Well, what was in, stuck in the back of my head is in 2010, the House of Bishops in Uganda reaffirmed, set out a, a family life and guide and reaffirmed family planning, spacing of children, raising them up and not looking as children as economic commodities, have as many as you can to take care of you in your old age, but children are a blessing and make each one individual and special and love. Mm -hmm. Well, I saw bits of the Archbishop of Uganda's installation service and I must admit, I'm listening to his sermon, and then I'm also looking at my iPhone, texting my wife, how's the, you know, <laughs> yeah. I, I'm, I'm a normal human being. <laughs> well, in his installation service, the Archbishop of Uganda, and I finally remembered where I remember this from, he said, you know, he talked about the importance of empowering women economically, socially, within the life of the family, and birth control was one of these issues. So in his installation service, his you know, where he sets out who his agenda, he talks about birth control. And then he goes on to say, but abortion is not birth control, abortion is murder. So we do not support abortion under any circumstances whatsoever. We advocate family planning. So it, it's just a wonderful example of the West, of newspapers basically treating, it was too good not to be true. Sure. and. and they're looking for a non-COVID story. Somebody gets his, you know, his circulation desk manager sits down. Okay, everything in the newspaper is COVID. Go get me a non-COVID story. All right, I'll find something out there. There's got to be something. And yeah. Kevin, I went on later to discover after I wrote this story that uh, 
that uh, National Public Radio also had this story. <laughs> Imagine that. that! They basically rewrote the Uganda, the Guardian story from the Uga uh, <sighs> story Copy about paste, from yes. the Guardian. And nobody, Public Radio, NPR, or the Guardian never bothered to contact the Archbishop of Uganda's office to find well, out, is it true? I mean, the biggest thing that I think is taking a crash in the last decade or two is journalism. The journalism that we were brought up with where uh, my dad would go out and to the porch, he'd get the morning paper, sit down, read the whole thing, and be well informed because each article had kind of both sides of every story. You know, he would know what everybody thought uh, that were correctly uh, asked by a reporter. That doesn't exist anymore. It, the, the reporting has taken such a change. It, even in the Anglican world, um, mm -hmm. Kevin, do you remember when we were in Dar es Salaam and we were in a hotel with the archbishops mm -hmm. and after the business sessions were over, a number of the archbishops would come out and socialize with us. Yeah. Andrew Hutchinson was the Archbishop of Canada. Sure. Very liberal, pro-gay, charming man, loved to chat with and basically we were we had social relationships. We didn't hate this guy. We didn't Friendships. agree with him. Yeah, we did. Yeah, absolutely. But you, you. And now, I just remember, like at the the last Canterbury Lambeth uh, primates meeting, where you've got the reporter from the Anglican Communion News Service coming in to torpedo Foley Beach, and then tossing out questions to Justin Welby. In other words, the animus that we see in Washington. Uh, White House press briefings where the you really know these people dislike Donald Trump and would no more sit down and have a drink with him than they would with Adolf Hitler. Sure. We're starting to see that in some of the more sectarian uh, institutional corners of the Anglican world. Uh, That's it, terrible. It is. It's activism journalism. You know, I want to be a journalist so I can change the world. Well, that's not what journalism is. Journalism is not a device to change the world. It's a device to inform the world, to communicate what's going on. And you just watch what we call pundits and analysis. There's just no straight reporting done anywhere that I can see. I, New, I, New York Times this, used to be the, the, the paper of record. It's I, I've told this story a number of times, but I, it bears repeating. I remember at the one of the, the Plano conference at GAFCON, Larry Stamers of the LA Times. Good example. Larry uh -huh. sends all saints in Pasadena, a very liberal church. He's a liberal Episcopalian. LA Times, very liberal paper. He had a stand-up interview with Bob Duncan. I was standing there. Uh, I think it was Bruce Mason, who was the press officer at the time, was there. Mm -hmm. And Bob Duncan made a misstatement that sounded really atrocious. It was a perfect soundbite that Larry Stammers could have run with and made Bob Duncan look like a total jackass. But Larry Stammers turned off his, mic his tape cassette and said, Bishop, did you really mean what you just said? And the bishop, no, no, what I meant to say. In yeah, other words, right, Larry yeah. Stammers' job was not to get Bob Duncan, but to truthfully report what Bob Duncan was trying to say. And we don't see that anymore. We have gotcha journalists. Every question you see at the press conference with Trump is a gotcha question. You know, just short of, have you stopped beating your wife yet? You know, it's just, it's it's amazing to watch as a journal, journalist, you know, to, to see how this is turning out now. Um, let's finish up. Quick story. Last week we reported that the, well, we've been reporting this now for seven weeks, the Church of England has closed the churches to not just the membership, but to the clergy. You're not allowed to take your iPhone or a little mini camera or computer inside your church as a, a priest to live stream to Facebook to have services for your membership. The churches are closed. You can't go in there. And I guess right after our last show, not probably, I'm not going to take credit for this. George, you can. I won't. But they've changed their mind, sort of. They're going to offer some red tape to actually go back into the churches. Well, I do want to say that we did make a mistake, and we wish I need to set the record straight. Uh -oh. yeah. I suggested that the Episcopal Church had sued the Church of England, and Catherine Jeffrey Shorey had taken physical possession of all the Church <laughs> of England churches and expelled that was their wrong, clergy. Yes. No, no, that was that was South <laughs> Africa, that was South Carolina and uh -huh. uh, Fort Worth uh -huh. and uh, uh, Pittsburgh. That I, I made a mistake there. 
no, uh, being silly, uh, folks. The uh, bishops uh, overdid the government's advice of no social of social distancing and no public gathering by closing the churches, even to the clergy. Well, this caused a kickback that they hadn't seen in a very long time. Uh, Peter Selby, the retired Bishop of Worcester, who's a liberal, but still has a very high reputation among everybody as being a good pastor, wrote, had an article in the tablet where he said, the Bishop Church of England essentially exited the public square. It's moved religion totally into the private sphere outside of public life. Then there was a letter to the editor of the Times that had 800 clergy signatures and they closed the list when they hit 800, so there could have been more if if they kept it open a few more days, basically saying to the bishops, how stupid can you possibly be? And then George and Kevin roasted them well, for being yeah. silly. And so maybe it was George and Kevin at the last moment said, well, if, if we've lost those guys, we really need to get <laughs> it right. right. It's like you're losing Walter Cronkite. <laughs> so they had a Zoom meeting, the House of Bishops, and they've released a statement doing a U-turn. They're walking it back. And they're saying, we're going, because the situation has changed. Meaning, actually, Britain is now at the peak of the epidemic. More people are dying, but that's different. The situation has changed, and so we're going to start the reopening phases, and we're going to end this uh, ban and go through a three-step phase of reopening of then so many people, then so many people, but we're going to start by allowing the priests back in their buildings. Well, I want to thank the Church of England for finally changing their minds and doing the right thing eventually we'll see what happens uh hard to watch we're in a crisis this is our war as i talked about before uh let's finish up as people have noticed and i'm getting lawnmowers are coming down again they just mowed out here but you hear the lawnmowers coming back it's like a parade um, i thought it was the snowblowers because kevin we've been going on how long now is it yeah, this, it's is it, the front it, come in yeah, yet? Yeah, I know, it's gonna snow oh and i'm not gonna be pleased with it so quickly uh some people mentioned kevin we, we like the new shorter format again this is the way you guys operated for like eight years it's a quick 17 20 minutes in and out uh it's choppy can you keep this so I don't know. We're, we're working it out. I like just sitting down for 20 minutes and talking to George and, and uh, shooting out a couple stories. Um, this is how we, this is how two people operate in an Anglican news environment. The more I add to the show, three, four, five. If I had five theologians on here, we would talk for eight hours about one topic. It's just the nature of adding more and more voices. If you guys like just two voices, maybe we'll stick with that. Uh, go to the show comments and tell us, you know, if you like this new uh, less than thirty-minute format. You know, we'll see. We'll see what happens. George, I want to thank you for your time. It's been another fun week. I'll talk to you after the snowstorm, after the blizzard. Uh, send help. Send shovels. All my winter stuff is packed away. Jill and I did our spring cleaning already. My winter jacket's down in the closet. I have to get that out again. Do you have to put snow tires on your bike? Or? I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm, I'm going to cry. I mean, I survived so much. I survived COVID, and I survived the the murder hornets. I don't know about the snow thing, though. This this may this may be the thing that gets me. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 595 of Anglican Unscripted.